will all those people come to church? Come to church? You 70 people who watch this? <laughs> Unless you have your own church to go to. So we're looking at Trinity Sunday. It's year A. Um, uh, like uh, some of the high festivals are pretty much the same year A, B, and C, like Christmas, Easter, although it switches the gospel. But um, with this one, they rotate each, each of the readings, each of the years. Um, and for whatever reason, uh, they decided to really diverge from the original um, 1969 Roman Catholic three-year lectionary. The only thing that stays the same really is um, the epistle, uh, which of course gets longer. And longer. How did you ever guess that? And longer, yes. <laughs> Going from 1979 to 2019, basically everything stayed the same. They just took out some options. So there was an option of shortening the epistle, took that out. There was also an option of, <laughs> instead of the psalm, doing the uh, Song of the Three Young Men, the canticle, I get them all mixed up, but um, the Latin titles, but the, the shorter one. I will say, Father Allen did not let us take out the parts that were, could be taken out. Yeah. We had to read the whole thing. But weren't you on the committee for the 2019 <laughs> prayer book? Well, but we didn't write the lectionary. They didn't that, was, yeah, right. that was already set in stone. Yeah. We just put in the these and thous. I was thinking the same thing. Who lent them? Well, I don't know who was on the committee for the 2019 prayer book of the lectionary, but that, that group, whoever it was. Yeah. And then the only one I knew from the previous one was uh, Father Fuller, and there have been so many questions since then that I would have wa wanted to ask him, but I didn't know anything to ask him at the time. But yeah, I would like to, I mean, I don't really, I, I'm still kind of split on the three-year lectionary. I, just for the force of tradition, I would go back to the one that's been around for like 1,200 years or something. But, <laughs> but I think if, if I were going to, if I had to use the three-year lectionary, I would want to use the original one that's much shorter. That's just me. Some people just want to have a lot of words, and that's okay. Trinity Sunday. It's an interesting uh, festival. It's, it's now one of the, uh, the big ones, the principal feasts on the calendar, a holy day of obligation. Um, that kind of gets forgotten because it's Sunday anyway. So, But it wasn't always there. It gained really a lot of popularity with uh, Thomas Beckett. So he was consecrated a bishop uh, on Trinity Sunday. And it was, um, I think, just a very local custom uh, that time and place. Um, it had begun to surface around the year 1000 as an optional uh, commemoration in some places. Um, and it was maybe kind of the, the crest wave of his um, popularity that, that made it kind of spread far and wide and become universal. So if you look in the old Latin, Latin Missal, there is still, um, although it's never used on the Sunday, there is still at a first Sunday after Pentecost uh, set of prayers and readings. Um, you, would, you would pick it up if you had a, like a, a feria uh, weekday following and you resume the Sunday. So instead of resuming Trinity, you would resume the first Sunday after Pentecost, which you didn't use on the Sunday to start with. Just a little archaeological, liturgical curiosity. As for the commemoration, of course, it, it commemorates uh, a doctrine, the Trinity, but also kind of comes out of an event, which is the um, certainly the first council uh, of Nicaea um, in 325, but also the other councils that followed. So Constantinople was the next one where they finalized uh, the Nicene Creed. So we talked about the Nicene Creed. We actually never use the Nicene Creed. We use, well, we actually don't even use the Creed of Constantinople. We use the Creed of the Fourth Council of Toledo, uh, which is one that has and the Son. Uh, a little explanatory note about the Holy Spirit. But actually the Eastern Orthodox don't use the Constantinopolitan Creed either because they changed, and they get so upset about us changing, adding to it. Uh, we didn't, we, we added to it an ex ex explanatory note, but we didn't change it, but they changed it. They changed it from we to I. How dare they? <laughs> 
So rather than we believe, it's I believe. Are we doing the Athanasian Creed? There's yeah, so we'll sing that in procession at 1015. And, and then skip the Nicene Creed when we get to it, just because of time. Although it seems so odd to have Trinity Sunday and then skip the Creed. But we do another one that's much longer that has everything you need to know already in it. So that's, that's good enough. That could be your, your um, uh, um, formation, just yeah, I mean, Athanasian Creed and it's everything. Well, I tell you, a, a great uh, confirmation class would be pour over the Athanasian Creed and then look at all the Eucharistic prefaces because they tend to kind of cover all the ground in, in their different commemorations. Well, then you should include what the Catechism says about the Athanasian Creed because it, the whole thing is compelling, but that, it's just very good. So if you do, I have to go back and look at that. Yeah, do that. You're talking about the big one, the CCC? Mm -hmm. um, just out of curiosity, the 39 articles of religion begin with Number one, faith in the Holy Trinity. There is but one living and true God, everlasting, without body, parts, or passions, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker and preserver of all things, both visible and invisible. And in unity of this Godhead, there be three persons of one substance, power, and eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I don't know if the Trinity was really a battleground in England that time. It, um, I thought that was a good place to start, but... Um, I don't know if there's really any controversy uh, about that. There were later with other kind of radical Reformation groups and uh, Pentecostal groups that came later. There's oneness Pentecostal um, groups that only believe in God the Father and then they're basically Arians. Uh, so I have my handy dandy uh, flow chart of the Holy Trinity. Um, so this is basically everything you need to know uh, it has the Latin initials, so I apologize. So in the middle it says Deus, that means God. In the top you have a P for Potter or Father. Uh, SS is Sancta Spiritus or Holy Spirit. And then F, Filiae uh, for Son. And uh, so the, the center bars uh, all say Est or Is. So in other words, the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And then the outside, this is called the shield of faith, by the way. The outside says non-est, or is not. So the Father is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. So we keep the persons distinct, but recognize their unity in the center, in the divine substance. And we might say that we have sort of a tendency toward Arianism. And I was thinking about this earlier this morning. There's kind of like... I think an interrelated, you know, corrupt human nature kind of tendency where you, you know, if you don't hold the steering wheel, you're going to gradually run off the road. So just like there's an innate um, tendency toward um, Pelagianism of um, basically your inner pride, uh, having confidence in your own merits and so on, um, thinking you can get into heaven by impressing God. Uh, so there's also this kind of innate tendency, I think, to look upon Jesus as a creature who um, really excelled and got it right and was kind of adopted as God's son, almost with the idea that that's what we're shooting for ourselves. Um, and in fact, that's almost like the, the basis of the entire theological approach of Mormonism and, and some other groups, uh, even though they might not think in, think in those terms. But I think those two are kind of intertwined. We have a tendency toward Pelagianism. We have a tendency toward Arianism. So think about when people talk about God. If they ever say God and Jesus, that's cluing you in. They're probably, if not outright Arians, have that, they're, that Arian tendency is kind of surfacing to look at Jesus as the most exalted creature of God who kind of uh, really excelled and got it right and was promoted into the Godhead, uh, adopted into God, made partially God. There's different variants on that. So Arius was a priest in Alexandria, Egypt, and um, he uh, was a great 
preacher. He was renowned as a kind of a showman in the pulpit. Um, and so he was very popular. And then uh, one thing really got people stirred up uh, was he said, there, there once was a time when Christ was not. There's not really a way we would talk. We would say, there was, once upon a time, there was a moment where Christ did not exist. That's what he was getting at. So in other words, the Son is not eternal. He started at some point. And his Godhead wasn't, doesn't go back to the beginning. It begins later on. So they looked especially to like the, uh, the baptism of Jesus, where the Holy Dis Spirit descends upon Jesus and the Father says, you are my beloved Son. And that's later known as adoptionism, the idea that God kind of, the Father adopted him as his Son and brought him into the fellowship of the Godhead. Um, well, there was pushback about this, and um, eventually uh, local councils were called, and then finally uh, an ecumenical or wor worldwide council was called by the emperor because he was like, look, I, I really want this church thing to be kind of a cohesive factor in the empire now, and I can't afford you guys splitting the empire up. So y'all, I'm going to lock you in a room, and you're going to come out agreeing. Um, so they were kind of forced into it, but... Uh, it's probably a good idea because um, things were not working. And in fact, it took a long time for things to really iron out centuries because you had uh, resurfacing Aryan emperors who you know, were in power and um, the, the Gothic Christians outside the empire became Aryan and that, that kind of stayed out there for a long time. I'm not but sure about that one. But use, there's there's a lot of verses yeah, that you can kind of tweak yeah, and they use shoehorn into that view. A lot. For their weirdness. And the great uh, defender of the faith uh, was Arius. Uh, I'm sorry, Athanasius. Arius was the detractor. Um, Athanasius was a deacon uh, for his bishop of Alexandria, Egypt, um, Alexander of Alexandria. And um, he succeeded him and spent, I don't know, half his ministry in <coughs> exile uh, running from Arians who were chasing him. And uh, there's the, the most famous part is when he's escaping down the river and they're chasing after him. They turn the boat around and head the other way. And uh, they shout across, have you seen Athanasius? I'm like, yes, he's, he's sped down that way. You know, hurry up and you might catch him. And he's going the other direction. And it was, it was uh, th there was a saying, a Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius against the world. Too bad for the world. Uh, because if you have the truth on your side, that's all you need. Um, let me read a little excerpt from Athanasius. He says, it will not be irrelevant to examine the ancient tradition and the doctrine and the faith of the Catholic Church, which, as we know, the Lord handed down, the apostles preached, and the fathers preserved. For on this tradition the church is founded, and if anyone abandons it, he cannot be a Christian, nor have any right to the name. And so the Trinity, which is recognized in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is holy and perfect, and has no adulteration of that which is foreign or external. Nor is it compounded of creator and created matter, but it is endowed with the complete power of creating and energizing. Its nature also is consistent with itself and undivided, and its energy and activity is one. For the Father makes all things through the Word in the Holy Spirit. And in what way the unity of the Holy Trinity, or sorry, in that way the unity of the Holy Trinity is preserved. Thus in the Church one God is preached, who is above all things and through all things and in all things. Yes, certainly above all things as the Father, the first principle and origin and truly through all things, that is, through the word, or the logos. That's where we get the word logic also. And finally, in all things, in the Holy Spirit. When St. Paul was writing to the Corinthians about spiritual matters, he traced all things back to one God, the Father, as to the fountainhead in these words. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of working, 
but it is the same God who inspires them all and every one. Then he goes on a, a bit more, but I think he got, got the sense of, of Athanas Athanasius. And also, uh, before we move on to the first reading, one um, important thing to remember about um, the council of Nicaea and those that followed was th it wasn't like a congress where there's a democratic vote about doctrine. So they didn't meet to decide, you know, what's, what's our doctrine going to be? All in favor of Humoousion, raise your hand. You know. It was they, they met because there was a problem and Arius needed to be rejected. The question was, what do we do with him and what do we say about it? Uh, so what, what kind of statement do we need to make um, in, in regard to this problem and, and what kind of condemnations do we need to make? And so if you look at the first creed of the Council of Nicaea, uh, after all the familiar part comes a list of, uh, and if you say this, and if you say that, and if you say that, which is basically all the things that Arian, uh, Arius said, then you're anathema, you're condemned. Um, so it's very different from the one that we're familiar with when you get toward the end of it. Well, let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who has given unto us thy servant's grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity and in the power of the divine majesty to worship the unity. We beseech thee that thou wouldst keep us steadfast in this faith and evermore defend us from all adversities who livest and reignest ever one God, world without end. Amen. And the, uh, the creed of St. Athanasius was not um, written by him. It was named for him. It's, uh, I guess you'd say an anonymous, but uh, he is so identified with the Trinity that it picked up his name. Well, let's look at the first reading from Genesis chapter 1, and then we, we spill a little bit over into chapter 2 just because it ends that first creation story. When we talk about two creation stories, the, the first one is kind of the big scope, and then we zoom in for the more um, human story for the second one. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and separated the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God saw the firmament, God called the firmament heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning a second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind upon the earth. And it was so. The earth, the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of, of the heavens, to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be lights in the firmament of the heavens, to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made also the stars. And God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the firmament of the heavens. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds 
and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the cattle according to their kinds, and everything that creeps upon the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God blessed so God created it's so tight together. God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps upon the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all his work which he had done in creation. All right. Definitely a, a masterpiece of uh, literature and uh, our heritage. And it's important to remember also that when uh, the Torah was written, so the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, um, it begins in the beginning not just out of sort of curiosity, where does everything come from, but it's more like, Israel, this is our story. Where do we come from? We come from bondage in Egypt, um, but what's the backstory of that? And so they begin not at the call of Abraham, um, but at the beginning of everything. So it, it's like Israel's story, the story of God's family starts with creation, not with any particular person or any particular moment after that. So it's definitely the big, big scope view of things. There's a lot of intriguing uh, details and uh, things to consider. It ends up with God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because God rested. There's this idea of uh, he rested and was refreshed um, that's mentioned uh, in Exodus and I think also might be mentioned uh, after this in the second creation story. And it's, it's intriguing that the seven days of creation are the days of creation even though it was six. So there's this, this two elements that come into the creation story, this idea of, of um, segments, that it's not all just kind of one thing. It's not like uh, Leonardo da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa with one stroke, you know. <laughs> that it had every little element of paint on the brush and every, covered everything. It wasn't like that. It was like, let's do this, now let's do this, now let's do that. And so there was kind of a, 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 a cycle of, of things that happened. Those who are interested and believe in evolution, of course, they, they look and say, well, that's an example of how that kind of works there, that different things happen in, in sequence. But I think the overall picture is that, that that God, this is the way he does things. He doesn't do everything just all at once in one big flash like a magician. Um, he works through time, and that's the story of Israel after that, that he does things in segments. He calls out one guy, Abraham, I want you to be the father of a family. Um, and then the, the family is born and continues and has its own origin story and uh, into captivity and out of captivity and learning the ways of the Lord and wandering through the wilderness and taking the land and on and on and on. So this is God's pattern, uh, that he does things in stages. And that also 
that rest is a part of it. Uh, so God blessed the seventh day, hallowed it, and we might say, put it in the sequence even though nothing happened on that day. Or, or we might look at it another way, that something very important happened, refreshment. And that's a, a part of the pattern that we should follow as well. And when we get the uh, commandment in the Ten Commandments about keeping the Sabbath day, um, that's the one that's given initially. Uh, fo follow the pattern that God himself laid out for us. But then at the end of the story, when we get the, the whole law reiterated in Deuteronomy, uh, there's another reason added. Remember that once upon, once upon a time you were slaves in Egypt. You didn't have a day off. Now that God has given you a day off, you better keep it. <laughs> Otherwise, it has a tendency to get away from you. Um, let's see. Also, one of the th critical things about the creation story is um, speaking. So we find the Trinity involved in the very beginning. Um, the Spirit of God moves over the face of the waters. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's being communicated there. Watching, being present with, and then God speaks. Let there be light. And there was light. Uh, so God speaks again and again, and that's how things happen. But it's, it's, a, a lot of it is, is about bringing order to chaos. So at first, the earth was a big kind of formless blob, I guess you'd say. There was darkness. And so then the light comes and separates light and darkness. And then the blob separates with a firmament, you know, something to hold the water back. And then the waters recede, and they become this separation of land and seas, of uh, air, or the heavens and the, and the land, and uh, the light and the darkness, and, uh, and the seasons, and uh, then the different um, living creatures, and so on. And finally, the last creature, uh, human beings, there's the separation of them into man and woman. Of course, that becomes the focus uh, in the second story that zooms in for the close view. I never thought in my lifetime that, uh, that this would be a bigoted, controversial verse. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That's uh, Genesis 1, 27. Is that because you can't have a male and a female anymore? Yeah. Or you can't look upon that as being... Um, set by God, or immutable. I, I learned a, a, another uh, little biological tidbit, is that uh, your hand will show whether you're a male or female or not by the length of your finger. So it's like, I think if this finger is longer than this finger, you're a male, and if it's shorter, then you're a female, something like that. I don't know if that's 100% the way it is, but I don't know. That was clickbait, Father. There's clickbait? many, there's yeah. other things. There's I mean, there's, yeah, there's a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. Serious <laughs> things that show that you're male or female. But <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> That's why you can dig up a skeleton after, you know, thousands of years. Yeah. They can say, oh, this is a woman, this is a man. <laughs> Let's see, anything else to point out? Let's turn to some of the fathers that talk a little bit about the Trinitarian aspects here. Uh, Ephraim the Syrian, it was appropriate to reveal here that the Spirit hovered in order for us to learn that the work of creation was held in common by the Spirit with the Father and the Son. The Father spoke, the Son created, and so it was also right that the Spirit offer its work, clearly shown through its hovering, in order to demonstrate its unity with the other persons. Thus we learn that all was brought to perfection and completed by the Trinity. And uh, St. Basil the Great says, When the earth heard, let it bring forth vegetation and the fruit trees. It did not produce plants that it had hidden, that it had hidden in it, nor did it send up to the surface the palm or the oak or the cypress that had been hidden somewhere down below in its womb. On the contrary, it is the divine word that is the origin of all things made. So the, the word speaks it into existence, calls it forth. 
Well, and that is also the reason why this reading is chosen for Trinity Sundays, because at the very beginning, we see all three persons of the Trinity uh, surfacing in the reading. And then, of course, there's this intriguing um, singular versus plural thing going on here. So in the beginning of the first verse, God, that's Elohim. Im is the plural ending. So you would think it's the gods, plural, but it treats it like a singular. Um, and so basically this is the Hebrew way of saying capital G. Um, in the beginning, capital G, God created the heavens and the earth. But then you get down to the creation of man and woman, and it's let us. So then the Elohim said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So of course the church fathers said, you know, there's a little hint of the Trinity there at the beginning as well. It could be that God is speaking to the, as he does in other places, the kind of heavenly court. But there's never the teaching really in Judaism that we're made in the image of the angels, just in the image of God. So in that sense, it doesn't quite exactly fit. But it certainly does fit in the Trinitarian view uh, that the Church Fathers saw this. And that's also a reminder that we're not just made in the image of the Father, but we're made in the image of the Son and of the Holy Spirit as well. And then that feeds a lot into St. Paul talking about salvation um, is the process of conforming us to the image of Christ. Well, our um, psalm is Psalm 150. And this um, caps off the hymn book of ancient Israel. Although in the Greek there is a Psalm 151, and uh, I was reading in um, Father Reardon's book, um, it has a title in the Orthodox Church, it's something like, The Psalm That Is Never Read in Church, <laughs> or something like that. You know, so it's like, well, we have it, we don't quite know where it comes from, but we don't use it because we know it doesn't belong in the list from the beginning, but somebody found it and stuck it in there. And it's basically, it's, it's charming, it's, um, it's just um, a David's um, kind of little autobi autobiographical um, tale. So it says, Small I was among my brothers, the youngest son of my father's house, and a shepherd to my father's sheep. I used my hands to craft a lyre, and a lute I fashioned with my fingers. Who would tell this to my Lord? For the Lord will hear it for himself. His messenger did, the Lord commission, and took me from my father's flocks. With the oil of consecration he anointed me. Tall and handsome were my brothers, but the Lord took no delight in them. To face the foreigner I went forth, and he cursed me by his idols. But I seized his sword and beheaded him, and removed the reproach of Israel's sons. So it sounds like a, a, a little canticle that was composed, you know, in celebration of his victory over Goliath, but it, it never found its way into that book, so it was just tacked on here at the end. The last, I think, four, or maybe it's five psalms, are called the Hillel Psalms. They all start with the word hallelujah, praise, and then um, I think they end with the word too. Yeah. And so when it gets to the end, it says, Praise the Lord, that's hallelujah. Praise God in His holy temple. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him for His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the blast of the ram's horn. Praise Him with lyre and harp. Praise Him with timbrel and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And it's a wonderful psalm and has gone through many uh, beautiful uh, musical settings. I don't know what the, uh, what is it, the Campbellites? Uh, they don't have musical instruments in church. I don't know what they do with this one. It's this congregational church. I know they don't have <clears throat> Yeah. Church of I remember in the movie uh, The Apostle, Robert Duvall, uh, I think this is his first sermon when he gets a little church together and, and he has some kids bring some different instruments they have, you know, a horn to toot over here and some 
symbols to clang over here and he has him kind of walk through it all as he goes through the message and it's very charming. I like that movie. Um, also, one thing to take notice of at the end, let everything that has breath. Um, so the breath of life comes from God and we see that more vividly in the second creation story where God breathes into man the breath of, it, of life, breathes into him his spirit and uh, so that's why he becomes a living being. And so everything that God has made it, has given life, um, owes it to him to give him praise in return. Let's look at the epistle, 2 Corinthians. And basically this is just chosen for the last line. So this is, I think, the only time in Paul's letters where he uh, uses the Trinitarian formula like this. Um, so that's why they chose it for the epistle here. Um, verses 5 through, I don't remember what it was, 10 or 8 or something was the optional part. Now it's all mandatory. 2 Corinthians 13, beginning verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are holding to your faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you, unless you indeed fail to meet the test? I hope you will find out that we have not failed. But we pray, God, that you may do no wrong, not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. What we pray for is your improvement. I write this while I am away from you, in order that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority which the Lord has given me, for building up and not for tearing down. Finally, brethren, farewell. Mend your ways. Heed my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of peace, love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So even though the epistle was chosen for the last verse, um, there are some other things that relate to the theme of Trinity Sunday as well. Um, he's, a lot of scholars think that 2 Corinthians may be a, several different letters kind of patched together, um, mainly because he seems to say goodbye a couple of different times. And then it continues on. Um, so this may be the, the last of several uh, letters that he has written to interact with them. And he um, intends to visit them again. And he knows that they have a lot of problems. They've been working on it. Um, he hopes that they will um, mature a lot by the time he gets there so he doesn't have to be too severe with them. So this whole thing about testing and, and proving yourself is, is really about you know, these are the things that you need to fix before I get there. And, and I, I have confidence that uh, even though it may have looked like a, a, a horrible process that uh, was just a big mess, I think in the end, um, I think you'll rise to the occasion. And he makes uh, several statements about um, our fidelity and obligation to the truth. Uh, examine yourselves, test yourselves, to see whether you are holding to your faith. Um, and don't you realize that Jesus is with you? You know, you're not on your own in this. Um, Jesus is in you, abiding with you in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, living within you as a, as a temple. So Jesus is with you, unless, of course, you fail to meet the test, in which case, you know, you're out of the church, you're not a real Christian and so on. But you should examine your faith and um, always make sure that it measures up to revelation, to the truth. Uh, verse 8, we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. So we have this underlying fundamental obligation to reality, uh, to the truth. In, of course, modern day um, parlance, the word uh, truth has evolved in its meaning, or at least the way that we use it. Um, so, of course, it, it, 
going way back, it had several different meanings. So, so one um, was what we might call a truism. You know, something rings true. It's not literally true, but it's meaningful in some way. And that has kind of taken over as the dominant uh, way that we use the word truth. So when you hear somebody talk about my truth, that's what they mean. You know, something that is meaningful to me. Not that I have my own individual reality, although some people act like that. <laughs> but but uh, everything becomes subjective um, when you kind of re retool the concept of truth in this way. There's a marvelous book, um, I think it's called something like Jesus, Two Visions, something like that. So it's Marcus Borg and uh, N.T. Wright. And Borg is the, they're both Anglicans, uh, Borg is the kind of re revisionist uh, scholar and uh, Wright is the more conservative. He's big on, you know, the reality of the resurrection, the physical reality and so on. And so they, they go through kind of the, the Apostles' Creed, kind of a list of different um, truth claims about Jesus, his, his virgin birth and his death and resurrection and so on. And uh, so they, they interact with each other and they kind of examine it from the two perspectives. And it's interesting to see side by side. And you see this um, idea of truth being come at from two different directions. So Wright would say, um, it's meaningful to me because it's true, you know, because it actually happened, like Jesus actually rose from the dead, that sort of thing. And then Borg will say, um, it's, it's true because it's meaningful. You know, I find it emotionally impactful, therefore it is true. You know, literally did Jesus' physical body start pumping blood again and stand up and walk out? No. You know, he, his, his body disintegrated to dust or whatever happened to it. Um, but, you know, he lives on in my heart. And so since I find that meaningful, then it's true. You know, that's why, that's the reason I say the resurrection is true. Not because I believe it literally happened, but because I think it's emotionally impactful. Did you see the clip from Father Jordan's homily? Mm -mm. No. Was that on Pentecost or? No, it was, it was back during, it was. Oh, was that the, the where he says. The resurrection one? Yeah. Yeah, the little kid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that was great. It's the one I I forgot that he asked a rhetorical question. He says, and we are supposed to believe that this is real. So I'm telling, I'm, so today I'm saying to you, do, what, what do we believe? And this little boy on the front row says, it's real. <laughs> but there was like a, there's like a dramatic pause, you know, yeah. he's looking around the room and then the yeah. kid speaks up and everybody. And then everybody right. claps and Father Jordan says, my work is done. <laughs> it was very, it was yeah. a very poignant moment yeah. in the church yeah. because you know this kid is like seven. Out of the mouths of babes, yeah. oh, that's mm -hmm. ordained perfect praise. Did he, uh, did he have more to say? Do you no. think? No. I don't know. I mean, the, he didn't hand over the mic. No, <laughs> but he shouted it. He didn't say it under his breath or anything. Yeah. Boy, yeah. He, he shouted it out. Mm -hmm. It's real. Yeah. It was great. That pregnant was pause really just <laughs> pulled it out of him. Yeah. Very cool. So I think this is, you know, a big um, topic for our own day about uh, the truth, this obligation for the truth. Verse 8, we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. And that doesn't really mean anything if you just take the subjective kind of approach to what truth is. Um, we cannot do anything that's not meaningful to us. Well, yeah, that kind of is inherent in that. Um, we cannot do anything against reality, but we can only um, speak for reality, defend reality. That's what we're advocating for. When we talk about the truth of the resurrection, we're just talking about reality, what actually happened. And we find it meaningful. Um, not even because it's true, but because it's inherently meaningful. I mean, there's plenty of things that are true, that are real, that are actual, that, what do I care, you know? Well, it, the saddest part is, you're, you know, if we 
held with objective truth and didn't make our own truth, we'd be a happier, we'd be happier people because when people invent their own truth, then it can constantly change and devolve and evolve into stuff where, oh, well, I don't even, I, I think I'm really supposed to be a boy kind of stuff instead of, mm -hmm. no, here's the, here's the objective truth. You are a boy. You are a girl. God ex you know, exists. Believe in Jesus walked the earth. All that, we would just be happier because we would have the concrete, the foundation. Yeah. And you get into this kind of feedback loop where you um, are constantly trying to convince yourself of what you think you already believe, you know. Um, when, when your whole basis of belief is your self-affirmation of something, right. then it's like, mm -hmm. you know, you begin to doubt yourself, so you've got to bolster your own confidence and in, in your own knowledge of everything. All right. Oh, let's see, anything to note about the last line? Interesting, just the, it, it, I don't think he's making a theological point so much, but it's just, uh, the Lord Jesus gives us grace. God the Father shows us love. Holy Spirit binds us together in fellowship. Um, so I think just a reminder that each, each person of the Trinity, of the Godhead, is constantly involved in your spiritual life. It's not like you're all involved with one but not the other, something like that. The Father is always close to you. Um, the Son is always with you, the Holy Spirit, and so on. You can't really... They do everything together. They're great friends. They do everything together. <laughs> they create together. They save together. Our Gospel reading is from Matthew 28. Uh, so this is the Great Commission, um, and it's, it's not the original gospel, so I think John 13, I forget which uh, one that is, or if that's even the right one, is the original in the three-year lectionary. But, um, and then, I don't know if the original three-year like, three lectionary had another gospel that might have been Matthew 28. It would seem that it would be year A because that's what year A is, Matthew's Gospel. Um, so, I don't know why they made some of the choices they made. Anyway, um, so this is, is there anything after this? No, this takes us right to the end of the, of the Gospel. Right before this, we had, at the beginning of chapter 8, Resurrection Morning, and then uh, the interlude in between these two are uh, the story about the soldiers uh, being bribed uh, to come up with a story about falling asleep and so on. Isn't there some some question by questioning by some scholars about this part right here that this was appended later? No, you you're thinking of Mark. So Mark has a shorter ending and a longer ending, okay. and uh, it's generally believed that the shorter one is the original, and then for whatever reason it was expanded upon. Although Matthew uh, is, is, is certainly strikes us as being um, shorter after the resurrection than we would have thought. Um, I'm not sure if Luke or John go on the longest after the resurrection, but I think we all tend to think that Matthew gives us a little bit more, but no, it's just this final chapter. He rises from the dead at the beginning of chapter 28 and then ascends uh, with a great commission at the end. So beginning at verse 16, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Now, I misspoke. I said, I think I might have said the ascension. There is no ascension recorded in um, Matthew's gospel. Um, there are two 
big divergences from the Ascension. Uh, one is the mention of the eleven disciples. So, um, oh no, wait a minute. No, we, we get uh, St. Matthias after, after the Ascension. Never mind about that one. But the other one is Galilee. Um, so, in, in all four Gospels, Jesus um, uh, appears and uh, says, Go tell the brethren that I want to meet up with them in Galilee. Um, and we'll, we'll talk there. And so it, it seems to be in Matthew's Gospel, this is what he wants to say. He wants to commission them for their earthly ministry, to continue on his ministry, to go into all the world and make disciples and uh, baptize them. Of course, baptism is something that uh, we're familiar with from John the Baptist, but it wasn't something that was new in Judaism. It was something, of course, there's ritual washings all over the place in Judaism. But this particular one, this kind of full-fledged, um, all the way in baptism, mikvah, bath, is how you received converts. So you could receive Gentile converts, and the last step um, was baptism. But they're going to be baptized in the name of all three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's a story in Acts about uh, some people who have only been baptized in the name of Jesus. Uh, so they got mixed up somewhere, didn't do it right, and so uh, the apostles come along and uh, pray for them to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we are to make disciples, that is learners or students, followers of Jesus. Uh, we are also to baptize them, bring them into the church, and to teach them to observe all the commandments of Christ. And uh, Mark also has a similar uh, thought at the end, I am with you always to the close of the age. And that's why he mentions about uh, miracles, attesting uh, as you go out there and spread the word that I am acting with you. There's also this very intriguing um, you know, we wish we could have known more. Verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And I don't know if this perhaps is um, an allusion to the whole Thomas story, which we don't get in Matthew, uh, but which comes in John. Um, that could be. Uh, the, it seems like the scene that we're presented is that it's just the 11 disciples, that it's not like a big crowd. We kind of tend to conflate in our mind a few different elements. So we think of the Ascension when we read this story, and at the Ascension there is a crowd. But here, as far as what we're explicitly told, there's not a crowd, but there's just the 11 disciples. Uh, they're on this kind of mountain retreat uh, with him as he asked, and uh, he gives them this commission. And uh, he does so by saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, do what I say. Go make disciples. Baptize them. Teach them. And don't worry. I'm with you every step of the way. All right. Well, other thoughts? Let me close with this note um, from the study Bible about the Numatamachi. The, the Numatamachi. It's, a, it's of all the heretical groups, this has the, the best name because it sounds like a mafia. Um, but it means the spirit chewers. So the Numatamachi, which means her spirit fighters, were, I think chewers is more literal, were a mid fourth century group who argued against the deity of the Holy Spirit. While some defended the deity of the Son but rejected the deity of the Spirit, Others, like Eustathius of Sebast, continued to doubt both the divinity of the Son and the Spirit. Eustathius argued that the Spirit was more like an impersonal force of divine energy who helped accomplish the Father's will. Basil of Caesarea provided a robust response to this group, appealing to the baptismal formula in Matthew 28:19. Basil argued that the Spirit should be afforded the same glory given to the Father and the Son. Clearly, the Spirit is unique and personally invested in all the divine activities of the Father and the Son. Basil points out specifically to the power of the Spirit's operations 
and the work of the Spirit in sanctification. He summed up his theology of the Spirit with a doxology that says, Glory be to the Father, with the Son, together with the Holy Spirit. So I guess it originates with him. From the time of the Numadamachi controversy, the Church has always affirmed the Spirit is God and should receive the same adoration and respect given to the Father and the Son. The Spirit is not some kind of super force or divine energy. The Holy Spirit has been active from creation, giving life, inspiring the prophets, and indwelling believers. And of course then this, uh, the, the whole section on the Holy Spirit was um, added uh, to the Nicene Creed in 381 at the Con Council of Constantinople, first Constantinople. All right, well thank you so much.